They have got a problem from Cambridge University's maths admissions exam, STEP. This problem is a number theory one, and it's quite nice slash easy if you've seen this type of number theory before, and if you haven't, you're in for a treat. For any positive integer n, the function f of n is defined by f of n equals n times 1 minus 1 over p1 times 1 minus 1 over p2, blah, 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 up to 1 minus 1 over pk, where p1, p2, all the way up to pk are the only prime numbers that are factors of n. Thus, f of 80, for example, is 80 times 1 minus a half times 1 minus a fifth, because, of course, 2 and 5 are the only prime factors of 80. Part 1, uh, oh, sorry, I'll, I'll tackle this problem part by part. Part A, part 1, f of 12 and f of 180, they want us to evaluate, and then we want to show that f of n is an integer for all n. So this is a pretty common start to a step problem. So lots of step problems are formatted like this, where they give you a bit of an introduction, they introduce either a new function or concept, and the, the first part of the problem will just be to check that the student is happy with that concept or happy with that function. So here they're doing that by just asking us to evaluate some numbers. So f of 12 here is going to be 12 times 1 minus 1 over the primes that divide 12, which is 2 and 3. Not too difficult to evaluate this, it just turns out to be 4. What about f of 180? Similar thing, it's not too difficult to find the primes that divide 180, it's 2, 3, and 5, so it'd be 1 minus a half, 1 minus a third, 1 minus a fifth, and if you work all this out, it turns out to be 48. Great, nice and straightforward. There will be very little marks awarded for this part one here. This part is not to benefit the examiner or to showcase any kind of mathematical skill. It's more just for, the, for you as the student to go, okay, cool, this is what, what's happening with this function. Um, what about part two? We want to show that f of n is an integer for all yeah, for all n, and this is true. You might, you know, why would why would this not be an integer? Well, we've got potential for this not to be an integer because we've got some fractions here. But thankfully, the things that we're dividing by, so each of these fractions are like p one minus one over p one, p two minus one over p two, and so on, times p k minus one over p k. But we've got this times n at the start, and we know that n has factors p1, p2, p3, all the way up to pk. So those will all get cancelled out by something in the end. There might, might still be some lift up, something left over in n. For example, if it's p1 squared times p2, you'd still be left with a p1. Um, that's fine. That's only going to add to the integerness of this number. But then it's just going to be the product of integers, and that would remain an integer. Great. OK, part b. Prove or disprove by means of a counterexample each of the following. So part one, f of m times f of n equals f of mn. f of p times f of q equals f of pq, if p and q are distinct primes. And part three, f of p times f of q equals f of pq, only if p and q are distinct primes. This is interesting because each of these three parts are suspiciously similar. Now let's look at part one here, f of m times f of n equals f of mn. I presume this means for all positive integers mn. Now, this has to be false. Why, why am I so sure this has to be false when I first read this? Well, if it was true, these parts would be very straightforward. If this was true for all positive integers m and n, then this part would be true and this part would be false and I can move on to part c. But that's probably not going to be the case because they've given me a part two and part three. Obviously, that's not a proof, but that's just my intuition. If I'm solving this problem, I know the fact that there is a part two and three, and it's probably not just going to be so simple as to just use the result from part one. So I suspect that this is not true, in which case I just need to find a counterexample. And now you may not have seen this, this num sort of number theory before. You might not even know where to begin with a counterexample. If that's the case, let's just play around with this. Let's plug in some small numbers. In fact, the two smallest numbers you can plug in that aren't 1 and 1, if you go 2 and 2, that actually works. So if you plug in f of uh, m and n are both 2, you can easily evaluate those are 1 times 1, and this thing here will be f of 4, which is going to be 2, because uh, it's going to be 4 times 1 minus a half, which is 2. And that would give you a counterexample. Great. Okay, part 2. f of pq equals f of pq. Sorry, f of p times f of q equals f of pq if p and q are distinct primes. This turns out to be true. Um, again, if you're not too sure whether this is true or false, you could just try with some primes and go, OK, it works with these. Maybe there is a reason that this is true, and it's not too difficult to see why this is true. Um, because if we start with one of the sides, f of pq, 
that's just going to be PQ multiplied by 1 minus 1 over the primes in the factorization of PQ. But since P and Q are distinct primes, this is just going to be 1 minus 1 over P, 1 minus 1 over Q. But now I can just pair these up because multiplication is commutative. I get this. And that there is F of P and that there is F of Q. Great. So that is part two. Now, part three is very similar to part two. Part two says f of p times f of q equals f of pq if p and q are distinct primes. And part three says f of p times f of q equals f of pq only if p and q are distinct primes. So literally a one word different. So we've proved one direction here. We've proved that this direction, if p and q are distinct primes, then this equation is true. Part three is essentially saying, if this equation is true, does that necessarily imp imply that P and Q are distinct primes? And the answer to this is no. And again, it's not too difficult to construct a counter example here. Um, so for, ex well, but basically the idea here is that notice that in this F of N, it doesn't really matter what power a prime is to, it's not gonna impact this thing here. So as long as we make n a like a power of a prime or something like this, um, we, we're going to construct a counterexample relatively easily. So I'm just going to use 2 squared and 3 squared just for illustration here. So if I do f of 2 squared times f of 3 squared, so f of 4 times f of 9, that's going to equal um, 4 times 1 minus a half times 9 times 1 minus a third. And now what is f of pq? So f of 2 squared times 3 squared, well, that's going to be 2 squared, well, 4 times, you know, 2 times 4. And then what are the primes in this? Well, it's just 1 minus a half, 1 minus a third. Like so. so these two things are clearly the same. However, of course, neither 2 squared nor 3 squared are prime. So, in fact, it doesn't hold true that if f of p times f of q equals f of pq, then p and q are prime. So yeah, statement 3 is false in general. Uh, and you may wonder, well, when is this statement true? And uh, in fact, I won't reveal the answer. Uh, maybe you know the answer. If so, drop it in the comments and give a proof as well. Part C, find a positive integer m and a prime number p such that f of p to the m equals uh, 146,410. This is quite nice. Um, we can kind of just follow our nose here. Let's start from the left side, f of p to the m. Well, what does that equal? Well, that's just going to equal p to the m times 1 minus 1 over p. Clearly, p is the only prime factor in this um, number. And now if we simplify this, this is just p to the m minus 1 times uh, p minus 1. So just writing this fraction as p minus 1 over p and expanding. Okay, we get this. So we need to make this equal to 146,410. So we need to find a value of p that satisfies this. And this is, you know, you might be tempted to expand this and bring this onto one side, but that's going to be a horrible equation to solve, especially because we don't know what m is. We don't know what the degree of this polynomial is. So we kind of almost just want to spot a solution. And I notice here I've got 14641, which uh, is a very nice number. Um, if you've not seen that before, 14641 is one like the third or fourth, maybe fifth row of the Pascal's triangle, or whatever, however you think about it. Um, but it's 11 to the power of 4. So that's 11 to the power of 4. And I've shoved a 0 at the end, which means multiply by 10. So I can just make this 11 to the 4 times 10. And that very conveniently works out here. So uh, P would be 11, and then M minus 1 would be 4. So M would be 5. 